God is the hero of every story. He's the hero of every story in the Bible, and he is also the hero of your story. We've seen throughout other stories, uh, life stories, that God is in fact the hero. He's the one that who, who redeems. And in First and Second Samuel, in the story of David, King David, we see very clearly that God is the hero of the story. And what ends up happening is that as God sees past the appearances and into the heart, in fact, he begins to, to shape and redeem the heart of David, we see that God's image becomes more and more clear in the life, in the face, in the, in the story of David. And so we're looking into what it means to have a kingdom heart, to, to allow God to see into our hearts, to, to, to be shaped by him, and to be able to show him to a world that so desperately needs to see God. At the very beginning of 1 Samuel 16, their people are longing for a king, and the people got a king, and a king named Saul. But in King David, he says, I will send you to get a king for myself. God actually chose David. He's choosing his people. Has he chosen you? We pray that you'd be blessed by this sermon series, that God would see into your heart and that you would allow him to shape you more and more into one who has a kingdom heart. Most people are familiar with the story of David. We see him throughout history in music, literature, and art. David is this amazing hero, an elegant poet, and he seems to have this impossibly close relationship with God, the kind of relationship that only an iconic Bible character could have. But when you look closer, you see his flaws on display. And despite the years in between our lifetimes, his story starts to look a lot like our own. The truth is, the story of David is the story of all of us. A perfect God loving an imperfect person. Good morning, everybody. Please open your Bibles, turn on your Bibles to 1 Samuel 24. And on behalf of all of us, we want to thank uh, our worship leaders today for leading us well as we've been singing to Jesus. It's also fun to look around and see students back from the EDGE conference up at Covenant College, looking forward to hearing all the great stories. Talk to Josh afterwards, and uh, he'll keep you uh, well informed. Well, 1 Samuel 24, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. So I said Josh, didn't I? He's the guy who was on the piano. Jose's the guy who went to the conference. Sorry, Jose. All right, this is God's Word. 1 Samuel 24. Let's hear God's Word. 1 Samuel 24. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goat's rocks. And he came to the sheepfolds by the way where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. And the men of David said to him, Here is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. So David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterwards, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him seeing he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose and left the cave and went on his way. Afterward, David also arose and went out of the cave and called after Saul, my Lord the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men who say, Behold, David seeks your harm. Behold, this day your eyes have seen. 
how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave, and some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See, my Father, see the corner of your robe in my hand, for the, by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. I have not sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you. But my hand shall not be against you. As the proverb of the ancient says, out of the wicked comes wickedness. But my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? After whom do you pursue? After a dead dog? After a flea? May the Lord therefore be judge and give sentence between me and you and see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. May God add his blessing to this reading of his holy word. You may be seated. Well, as you can see there in verse 2, our story takes place in a place called Wild Goats Rocks. Wild Goats Rocks. You know, can you imagine if you had some money and you wanted to open a cafe on Marco Island? I mean, there's a name for you, right? Wild Goats Rocks Cafe. It sounds, it sounds right. Now, this story that I read to you is a true story. But it is a story that can change your life because it's a story that helps you and helps me see what Jesus is really like. You see, with 1 Samuel 24, we find David and his men hiding in the back of a large cave in Wild Goats Rocks. It was a place of fresh water and still is to this day. Limestone cliffs dotted with all sizes of caves. David has been anointed to be the king. But the current king, King Saul, won't get out of the way. He's not ready to let go of the throne. In fact, he'd prefer to see David dead, not alive. Saul and David are enemies. So Saul comes out, and as you can see from the text, he's got 3,000 chosen men. And from the previous chapter, we know David has 600. Saul's got five times as many soldiers, and David's in the back of this cave with 600 of his chosen men. And David does not want to engage in battle. He, d he doesn't want to take on Saul. But Saul wants to kill him. And our story, as you could tell, reaches breaking point when out of all the caves that Saul could choose, he chooses this cave for his potty stop. Now, you don't need me to go into any more detail than that because you can picture the scenario, but that's what the text says. Now, to make matters worse, from the back of the cave... David's men are trigger happy. It's, they want Saul dead. Can you feel the tension? Seize the moment. David's enemy is vulnerable, is he not? All it would take would be a trained soldier like David to walk up with his sword, and Saul would be history. It'd be over in a heartbeat. But what, what David does is he sneaks over to where... Saul's royal robe lay and slices, I would love to have been there, slices off a corner of Saul's robe and then sneaks back to the rear of the cave. Vengeance. Revenge. Settle the score. Get even. Even the score. An eye for an eye. A tooth for a tooth. 
David is staring at the opportunity of a lifetime, and what does he do? He backs off. Have you ever felt like taking revenge? Have you ever felt the hot emotion of sweet revenge well up inside of you? Your spouse cheats on you. Your employees steal from you. Your boss lies to you. Your friends hurt you. Your children abandon you. Your church fails you. Your family misunderstands you. You can keep the list going. Vengeance in those moments feels so natural, so right. In fact, I I thought about this word before I put it into my laptop, and I think it's true. Vengeance at this point just feels irreversible, irresistible. Now, down through history, as you know, there are whole cultures where revenge and retaliation are the norm, and it has not stopped for centuries. God made us male and female in his image. And so what does that mean? Well, that means that built inside of you is a sense of what is right and just and fair. You know it. Now, God knows it perfectly. You and I know it imperfectly, but we still know it. Therefore, when you are mistreated, when you're harmed, when you're threatened, when you're abused, you know that what people have done to you is wrong. You know it, and you cry out for justice. Abel, the first man murdered in human history, what does the Bible say? His blood cries from the ground for vengeance and for justice and for retaliation. What's the gospel? I'm getting ahead of myself, but you need to hear it as I do. What is the gospel? Jesus' blood speaks forgiveness and life because he himself took the penalty that we, his enemies, deserved. We'll get to a little bit more on that later. You see, the problem is that when good things like justice and right and fairness get mixed in with our sinful anger, our desire for control, our impatience, man, it is so easy to plot revenge. Here's David. I mean, he's got a path from God straight to the throne. He's been anointed, but he's not yet been inaugurated. Saul is in the way. Kill Saul, throne is mine. You see, Saul, as you know, if you've, if you've read some of these narrative portions as, as uh, Gary and Scott and I are taking through, you through this series on David, Saul's a maniac. He's, a, he's throwing a spear at this guy who's playing the harp for him to calm him down. I mean, he's a lunatic, and he's chasing David all over the place, and one slice of the sword in that cave at Wild Goat's Rocks And David would be avenged, seated on the throne, and he doesn't do it. I don't know how many times I've read this chapter in the last two weeks. I keep coming to the back to that. He doesn't do it. Verse 7, he did not permit his 600 men to do it. In the original language in which this was written in Hebrew, it says he had to forcibly hold those men off. Can you just picture the drama in that cave? They're ready to charge. You see, the contest in that cave, if, if you've come into that cave with me this morning and all those details, it has so many layers, doesn't it, of tension and options and choices. Can you relate? I mean, over the years, you and I have hurt people. You, you may be aware of that or you may not be aware of that. You are aware, are you not, of times people have hurt you, unless you're in denial at some level. Being a pastor, I can tell you without exaggeration that I hear dozens of stories every year of people who've been hurt in small ways and in huge ways, and quite often in ways that I never thought possible. Look at David. David never asked for this role in life. He was just out shepherding sheep. 
<laughs> and God said, you're going to be the king. And he got Saul in the way. God appointed him king, and now David's running for his life. You know, the problem with revenge, uh, uh, Daniel Craig, if you're, uh, if you're Bond uh, fanatics, 007, Daniel Craig said this, revenge doesn't stop. That is so true. In fact, revenge is usually excessive. Rarely is it a tooth for a tooth. It's a tooth for a whole mouth. Douglas Horton said, while seeking revenge, while seeking revenge, dig two graves, one for yourself. You see, you know what an escalator is. Revenge puts you on an escalator to increasing pain for all parties involved. You know what I'm talking about? David chooses to not get on the escalator. Can you think of times that you have gotten on the vengeance escalator? Have you repented of those times? Can you think of times, praise God, the Holy Spirit helped you not to get on the vengeance escalator? <laughs> I can think of times I got on and then he got me off before it was too late. Now, so what David does, and I, I can't even quite feel all the drama of what this must have been like, but Saul exits the, the cave, goes back down where his 3,000 men are, and, and David comes to the mouth of the uh, uh, cave. Hey, Saul! Holds up the piece of robe. I mean, can you imagine the drama of this? And David then delivers what I'm going to call one of the greatest speeches in all of history. You could just read this time after time after time. 10 through 14. Let me just give you some snippets to remind you. 10. He's hollering out at Saul. Hey, behold this day, your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave, and people told me to kill you, I spared you. Or how about verse 12? May the Lord judge between me and you, and may the Lord avenge me against you, but my hand, not against you. How about 14? After whom has the king of Israel come out? Whom do you pursue? And David compares himself to a dead dog and a flea. And then he says, May the Lord therefore be judge and give sentence between me and you. And see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. You see, as David's talking, as David is acting, because that's the beauty, of, the beauty of narrative portions of the Word of God, we get to listen and watch. And so as David talks, as David acts, we get to see Jesus. Jesus committed. He committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. It's as if when Peter wrote those words, he'd had 1 Samuel 24 for his quiet time. Do you know that Jesus chose silence over verbal attack? I struggle with my tongue. There's things I want to say and things I do say that are so dumb. But look at this. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, you've said so. That's all he said. You've said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. When Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But Jesus gave him no answer, not even a single to a single charge, and the governor was greatly amazed. You see, David's appeal to Saul, as I said, is one of the greatest, if not the, one of the most humble speeches ever given. And so we get to see Jesus in David's reactions at Wild Goat's Rocks. Jesus chose trust over taking shortcuts. I tell you, Satan offered him some very appealing options, and Jesus didn't take them. 
Jesus rejected vengeance. David knew he was getting the throne, and he could have taken things right now and sped things along a little bit. But he entrusted himself to God. He waited for God to give him what God had in store for him instead of taking things into his own hands. Do you do that? Can you wait for God to give you what he has for you? Can you do that? Will you do that? Why aren't you doing that? When will you start doing that? Maybe you're already doing that. Jesus chose suffering over personal comfort. He chose waiting over paying back evil for evil. He laid down his life for whom? Us, his enemies. Instead of wiping us out, he waited until the kingship of the world was given to him by his Father instead of taking things into his own hand. You know what sin is, don't you? Sin is taking the place of God. Sin means I'm going to take everything into my own hands instead of placing everything in God's hands, even judgment and retribution. So do you see how faith works and why it's so powerful? Faith is effective because it radically changes your behavior and my behavior. Instead of doing what comes naturally, instead of doing what comes even sinfully, faith steers me in a much better direction. David chose humility and suffering over pride and conquest. So a couple of applications, a couple of applications for you. First one is this. Suffering gives birth to strong prayers, strong prayers. Don't you love it when you walk up to, uh, to, to somebody and you say, um, hey, what, out of the 66 books of the Bible, what's your favorite one? And I bet if I opened it up to the floor right now, we, we might get this book or that book, but inevitably the majority would be what book? Psalms. Everybody loves the Psalms. But you know, in some ways, that's unusual. Because what gave birth to the Psalms? Ease, comfort, pleasure, everything going great, perfect day? No, pain and suffering and hardship. That's what gave birth to the book of Psalms. And there's two Psalms in particular that David wrote because of this cave contest. You can read them this afternoon if you'd like. Psalm 57 is a really good one. Psalm 57, when he he was fleeing from Saul and he's in the back of the cave, listen to how strong this prayer is. Psalm 57, be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. You could never pray that way if everything's just gone wonderfully. (laughs) But when it's tough, man, you can pray some hard prayers. How about 142? So it's for your notes, Psalm 57 and 142 arise out of this cave story. Psalm 142, with my voice I cry out to the Lord. With my voice I plead for mercy from the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. When my spirit, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's, isn't it wonderful? I've had to visit somebody three times this week in the ICU. Now, that's not a fun place to be for anybody, especially if you're the one in bed. But I tell you, in the ICU, it's called the intensive care unit for a reason. You pray some pretty powerful prayers if you're laying in bed in the ICU. And that's what David is doing. You see, suffering gives birth to praying. Suffering gives birth to worship. Suffering gives birth to really seeking the Lord. Suffering gives birth to really wanting to live for the Lord. And that's what's going on. Suffering gives birth to strong prayer. Secondly, suffering shows us who is in control, and it's not us. If you've really suffered, 
you know. Lord, why am I suffering? Well, so you find out who's not in control. You see, the problem with vengeance is we're trying to take God's role as judge on ourself. But God's the judge, not us. Only God can judge perfectly. Seeing this truth then from this cave takes us on a direct path to the cross because God chose to do what? God chose to judge Jesus for your sins. Jesus was absolutely innocent in every way. And the gospel is that the Father sent His only Son to face the judgment we deserve. All the suffering in the world, even David's, and whatever you faced, cries for vengeance. And it cries for retribution. It cries for justice. Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see, suffering helps us let go of control so that we learn to trust the one who's in control. Do you know that many of a prop, many of, how's that sentence supposed to go? Many a problem, that sounds better, many a problem could be averted if we, like Jesus, would entrust ourselves to God and not take matters into our own hands. You see, we're being taught in our culture, do what comes naturally, follow your heart, do whatever feels right. That's rubbish. It's dangerous. If David had done that in the cave, <laughs> Saul's head would be rolling out of the entrance of that place. Simply rest, rest in Jesus through the storm. So, so far I've said suffering gives birth to strong prayers. Suffering shows who's in control. It's not us. Thirdly, suffering helps us see and trust Jesus because in the midst of our suffering, Jesus becomes so much more real. Isn't it amazing that the shocking fact of the Christian faith, and it's the only religion in the world that has this right, our star player, the most important figure in the equation, suffers the most. That's the brilliance of Christianity. Jesus gave it all up for us. He became so, and so he becomes so much more real to us in our suffering when we realize he suffered the most. And so he can come along and carry us through it all. So I want you to see then that this episode at Wild Goats Rocks is your story. It's my story. Go home and read it this afternoon, and you'll say, wow. I didn't know my story was way back in the Old Testament. You see, we were enemies of God. And Jesus, the son of David, died for the ungodly, God's very enemies. When we deserved death, we got life. When we deserved condemnation, we got forgiveness. When we deserved to be abandoned forever, we got taken on as God's very own children. Jesus, the king of kings, died for his enemies. He loved us while we were still his enemies. And he made us his friends. And what does he do? He comes and tells us the hardest thing in the world. Go and love your enemies. You say, wait a minute. Uh, I'm not doing that. He did it. That's exactly what Jesus did on the grandest scale possible. And David shows us what it looks like. Have you placed your trust in Jesus? Have you personally and individually placed your trust in Jesus? That's easy for me to ask because that's a preview of saying something hard. If you have not yet placed your trust in Jesus, you are still an enemy of God. And I would not recommend that as a good place to be. 
You see, David's experience in that cave helps us see Jesus. Do you see Jesus? Do you see how wonderful he is? Do you see that while we were yet enemies of God, God sent his own son to die for us? Do you see that Jesus humbled himself even to the point of death? Even though he never did anything deserving of death. So the farmer's out on his tractor. It's, uh, it's planting season. And so he's back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, tilling the ground, and he gets to the very back of his field, and he can't believe his eyes. There in the back of his field is a massive pile of garbage, broken equipment, household trash, smelly garbage piled up. Gets off his tractor, walks over, cannot believe his eyes. It appears from the tracks that somebody has backed a pickup truck to the back of his field and shoveled out all their garbage on his property. Well, he has no choice but to go back to the barn and get his own pickup truck, come back, take a shovel, and put everything on his own pickup truck so that he can continue to plow his field. As he's doing so, though, he finds the corner of an envelope. And it catches his eye. He picks it up, and sure enough, there's the full name and address of one of his neighbor farmers four miles down the road. And he starts smiling. So he loads the rest of the garbage in the back of his pickup truck, drives back home, and during the week continues to add to it. Broken equipment from his barn, trash out of the house, you name it. Back of the pickup truck is overflowing. And he waits till the dark of night. And he drives four miles down the road, backs up to his neighbors. You get it dumps it all out, pulls out, rolls the window down, turns the radio up. He felt so good. Sweet revenge was unbelievable. Now, can you imagine how this thing would have continued to escalate month after month? That is not what God did to us. Instead of paying us back for our sins, Instead of giving me, you, what we deserve, his righteous revenge, he dumped all of his justice on Jesus, restoring us from being his enemies to being his friends. That's the gospel that changes everything. Let's pray. Our Father, when people do evil toward us, help us to do good toward them. God, we ask that you would keep us from repaying evil for evil. God, keep us from all of our own tendencies to even think or desire evil, or to think unkind things about others. God, we pray that in our thoughts and our desires, our words and our actions, that you would help us to be completely Christ-like, even willing to do good to those who do evil. And then, Lord, we ask that so we get to see more of the depth of your love for us in Jesus, who took our sin, who took our evil in our place, that we might truly be saved. In Jesus' name, amen.